and perspectives with the Kentucky contributions. Our speaker is Dr. Fred Schmidt, PhD in a neuropsych is a neuropsychologist with the Kentucky Neuroscience Institute. Who I always forget that, and the Alzheimer's Disease Center at the Sanders Brown Center on Aging. Um, he is a renowned expert in neurodegenerative conditions, including Alzheimer's disease, and has lots, 30 years of clinical experience under his belt. And I'm so glad that he is sharing his time and expertise with us today. So without hesitation, take it away, Dr. Schmidt. Thank you. Okay. We still have people coming in, so hopefully we can... Um accommodate everybody and i want to thank everybody even though i don't see a lot of faces i see a lot of i see some frozen faces which is quite all right um but what i'd like to do today is kind of give you a whirlwind tour of what we know about alzheimer's disease um, i've been in the field for over four decades and um Yet that doesn't represent uh, the the whole scope of Alzheimer's research, which has been around for well over 120 years. So um, how do you compress 120 years into 50 minutes, maybe 55 minutes? That's the big challenge for us. But what I'm going to do is to give you a perspective, we'll talk a little bit about brain basics go from brain basics to some notable historical moments in Alzheimer's disease, uh, clinical and scientific research, then move into what we know about uh, what's happening in the brain. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the newer areas um, of interest, such as uh, mild cognitive impairment. We'll talk about some of the brain scans that are uh, currently being used in research that may in the near future uh, become more and more um, useful as diagnostic tools. And then talk a little bit about um, what is actually going on in the clinical trial world so that we can cover lots of bases um, with the talk. Um, but I want to start out by reminding everybody that the brain has these cells um, called neurons. And neurons are very interesting and unique uh, structures. Um, you can see it on the screen, but what's important is that neurons talk to each other. And when they talk to each other, they really create the person who we are and the memories that we um, both store and choose to forget, if you will. And what's important about this is, is that the brain has 20 billion neurons, give or take. And that's a heck of a lot. But these days, if you've been following the news um, and government spending, 20 billion is nothing, as they say. So what makes the brain unique is even more important. And this will become important as we talk about Alzheimer's disease, because as you know, Alzheimer's disease results in the death of these neurons. The synapse is what makes the brain as complicated as it is. Now we're getting into government budgets, a hundred trillion synapses. So those 20 billion nerve cells and this doesn't include all the other cells that are involved in the brain, such as microglia and glia and so forth, the neurons are the ones that really are the communication network. And 100 trillion synapses allows the brain to be a complex computer, if you will, and storing information, reacting to sensory information is all done by these 100 trillion synapses. The problem is, the processes in Alzheimer's disease directly affect the synapses and directly affect the neurons. And this is where we see the deterioration is as we lose synapses and then as we lo lose neurons. Now, what's really cool these days <clears throat> is that we can map the wiring of the brain, so to speak, how, how these neurons talk to each other, how they're organized and how 
they reach throughout the brain to let the brain function. And what you're seeing is a picture of the brain using a very unique MRI approach, magnetic resonance imaging, known as diffusion tensor imaging, DTI. And DTI actually lets us map not just the pathways that these neurons take, but the direction in which they communicate. And we can color code them with a computer. So you can see at the bottom, that bluish purple, that's the spinal cord and the spinal tract moving up into the brain. And then you see in beautiful color how those nerve cells in the brain are connected <clears throat> and how they connect to such things as the spinal cord, the memory centers and the temporal lobe and so on. And what's unique about this is, is that we've been doing research using this tool in Down syndrome, and I'll talk a little more about Down syndrome in a minute, to actually find where these connections or these, the wiring of the brain is changed in different conditions. So what you're looking at here uh, is a computer rendering of DTI connections. And what you see is in the in the blue is where people with Down syndrome have less connectivity than people who do not have Down syndrome. In the red, you see, and the green, you actually see different connections, differences that are related, one, in red to thinking ability. So where that those connections are weak, if you will, we can actually see that those weak connections lead to differences in people with Down syndrome ability to think. And in the green areas, we actually see where the differences are emerging between people with Down syndrome who have no dementia versus those who have dementia. So this is a very powerful tool that where we can measure brain structure and we can measure brain connections. And this is a useful tool for all sorts of brain conditions like cerebrovascular disease. Um, this is a tool used in studying other neurologic and neuropsychiatric conditions as well. And so I just love these pictures um, it, just because they're so colorful as we computer generate that direction. Are the connections going in, in an up-down direction, a left-right direction and so forth? And each brain is unique. So if you were to have a DTI scan of yourself, and let's say you have a twin and you got another DTI scan, you would already be able to discern differences, even without a neurodegenerative condition like Alzheimer's disease. So you all probably have some idea about what Alzheimer's disease is. And this is a picture of the original Alzheimer patient in her 50s in Germany, um, who was admitted to the hospital and was taken care of by a number of physicians, the most famous being Dr. Alzheimer. And one of the amazing things that we forget about Alzheimer's disease is shown at the bottom in the bottom bullets. And when I first started in this field, often I was being given the task of seeing an older person who might be depressed or might be demented. Well, often it wasn't the depression. And we know depression is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, but often people with Alzheimer's disease by becoming socially disengaged <clears throat> and apathetic often are mistaken for being depressed. And we forget that half of the people who develop Alzheimer's disease or in early stages have these changes in personality in addition to the classic thinking problems that we think about, the memory loss. And the field actually is rediscovering this by looking at what they call mild or minimal behavioral impairment, so that they're, they're trying to use this as a tool to identify early disease stages where memory change may not be as obvious. It may be personality change that leads to the diagnosis. Historically, <clears throat> there's a picture of Dr. Alzheimer. And what's fascinating is, is in 1906, 
this patient passed away, and he was able, with the help of a colleague, Dr. Bielschowski, to do microscopic studies of her brain tissue. And you see original drawings from Dr. Alzheimer of what is a neuritic plaque, that round shape there with the brown in it, and dying neurons. You can see these do not look anywhere like those colorful pictures of a neuron that I showed earlier. And for years, these were the fascinating hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. Until the 1970s, we discovered that there's specific tracks or circuits in the brain that are affected, and they use a specific neurochemical called acetylcholine as a memory chemical. Then, years later, we discover that beta amyloid protein, which I'll talk about these in more detail, are the building blocks of these neuritic plaques and lead to all sorts of other mechanisms in the brain, which each one deserves a series of talks in and of itself. And then in 1986, we discovered the tau protein. So we have the beta amyloid protein and the tau protein to remember. Those are a key component of these neurofibrillary tangles, these dead neurons where this tau protein is essentially discoverable. And so we have the basis for what we know as or cholinergic neurons, I'm getting an unstable internet connection, not a good sign. These, these neurons, these tracks go to all parts of the brain and facilitate memory and thinking. And as they die off, the connections die off. And this finding early on by White House and colleagues at Hopkins led to our first attempts at treating Alzheimer's disease. All of the drugs that you see in, in yellow here all affect acetylcholine. They boost the acetylcholine signal by helping the brain maintain acetylcholine signaling. And we actually had symptomatic therapies to boost some of the memory function in Alzheimer's disease. And the beauty of these drugs was they didn't just boost memory, but they also seemed to reduce some of the behavioral symptoms that are so problematic in Alzheimer's disease. And then in 2003, we discovered another medicine that seemed to protect the nerve cells to some extent. And amazingly, we now have these symptomatic therapies for well over 20 years. And they've been combined in the drug here in 2014 called Namzeric, where there's a combination of Aricept uh, or Denepacil and Memantine for many patients. Rather than taking two drugs, you take one. And Namzeric actually has higher doses of the drugs than were originally tested. So patients have some patients have benefited symptomatically, but not everybody benefits. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. The field of Alzheimer's spinal fluid and blood to try to find these Alzheimer proteins, the amyloid and the tau. And Clifford Jack, uh, did a, who's at Mayo Clinic, did a beautiful paper indicating his model of what happens in Alzheimer's disease. That's up here. And what he was showing us was that beta amyloid accumulates in the brain. Those plaques, and ta those plaques build up in the brain over time. And as a result, this amyloid affects synapses and is very toxic to the neurons. We start to see the neurons dying. And as a result, the tau protein is released from the neurons effectively and can be dis 
distinguished in spinal fluid and in brain now with new imaging. And as the, as the tau protein increases as an indicator of dying cells, we start to see thinking change. And then you have mild cognitive impairment, which means that very simply that you have symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, but it's not yet se severe enough to affect your daily functioning. You become demented when your daily functioning is affected by those brain changes. And so we see the proteins build up and can be identified in the brain. We see changes in brain structure, the green curve, and then we see cognitive decline. Once the brain structure changes enough, there's enough tau and enough beta amyloid, thinking is affected, which is the red line. And here's a good example from his original paper, um, which is really kind of cool. Here's a brain scan, um, an MRI scan of a normal 76-year-old. And this structure right here where the arrow sits, there's two of them, that's the hippocampus. That's your brain switchboard for memory. And as you can see here in the person with MCI, we're now seeing this change in brain structure, this green line appearing. You see the brain shrinkage when you look around the outside. You see the temporal lobe, which is also part of the memory system, shrinking because there's more space here. But now look at the hippocampi. You can see that they've, they're much, much smaller than this person here who's in their 70s and has a normal brain. And then finally, once a person is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, you can see the dramatic structural change in the brain and the dramatic change in the hippocampi. So this really got the field moving in a new direction, if you will. There, we jokingly talk about in the field of Alzheimer's research that you have Baptists, those people who think that, that beta amyloid uh, is the, the big culprit. And then you have Taoists uh, who believe that you don't really uh, talk about dementia until the tau protein is present. And what's really interesting is that we've learned a lot about the genetics since beta amyloid was originally uh, discovered as an important component of the dementia process. And we've learned that there's two kinds. There's what we call familial Alzheimer's disease or FAD, and then there's sporadic Alzheimer's disease. There's no clear inheritance involved and no clear gene mutation. Although large genetic studies have come up with well over two dozen candidate genes that may be involved in Alzheimer's disease. But familial Alzheimer's disease has really driven home the message that beta amyloid is a real problem for the brain. And we've known it's been associated with Alzheimer's disease since those very first plaques, although the protein itself was not identified until much later. But familial Alzheimer's disease is really, the good news is it's rare. And it involves these two gene mutations on chromosome 21 and 14 that drive overproduction of beta amyloid and drive the Alzheimer process. Um, you also have chromosome one, so I misspoke. Um, chromosome 21 is related to the amyloid precursor protein or APP and presenilin one and presenilin two are chromosomes 14 and one. And chromosome 21, in particular, mutations there, such as Down syndrome, where I showed you those scans before, they triplicate that protein. Down syndrome involves three copies of that chromosome instead of two. And so people with Down syndrome overproduce amyloid precursor protein, and that puts them at high risk for developing Alzheimer's disease as they grow older. And they tend to develop Alzheimer's disease decades before the general population uh, develops Alzheimer's disease, which is seen in what we call late onset or, if you will, sporadic Alzheimer's disease, which 
is a much more complicated picture. <clears throat> and I'll talk about that some, but there are multiple genetic risk genes that are being identified. The most common being the apolipoprotein E4 allele. So if you have this apolipoprotein E4 allele, your risk is elevated for Alzheimer's disease, but it's not guaranteed as it is with those, those presenilin and the amyloid precursor protein mutations. So there is a strong genetic signal that we've discovered, but we still haven't figured out all the details because no surprise, it's as complicated um, as you might expect. And that's why we continue to do research. So let me give you an example of what it looks like from our, Alzheim our Alzheimer's or Down syndrome aging study. So here's the effect of that chromosome triplication. Even as young as eight years of age, we start to see amyloid plaques. That's what you're seeing in that picture that popped up. The good news is <clears throat> at that young age, people with Down syndrome still seem to be able to clear that protein out of the brain. And that's an important area of research today is what leads to leads people to be able to clear the amyloid from their brain and not develop Alzheimer's. And we'll talk about that in a bit. But in their 20s, people with Down syndrome start to show tau, these bright green dots. This is a stain of a nerve cell. That's the body of the nerve cell here. And you see that tau is starting to appear in part in response to the beta amyloid in the red, which is in the cell. And then as people get into their 30s, the amyloid begins to accumulate and stay in the brain. This is the classic plaque of Alzheimer's disease. And then in their 40s, the plaques here, the round body, and then the tangles in green, the staining, begin to appear. So usually by the age of 35 to 40, people with Down syndrome have Alzheimer's pathology in their brain. But not everybody gets Alzheimer's disease. Not everybody with Down syndrome, even though they have these pathologies, develop Alzheimer's disease. In the past, we used to say, well, everybody with Down syndrome is going to get it. But the, the studies that have been ongoing have shown that not everybody gets it. And as a result, we have a new study that's going on on this genetic form of Alzheimer's disease called the Alzheimer Biomarker Consortium for Down syndrome. And if you happen to know anybody with Down syndrome over the age of 25 or know of somebody who knows of somebody, these individuals are invited to join this project where we track the Alzheimer changes in the brain in an effort to find the protective components. Since not everybody gets the disease as shown here, what in these individuals leads to Alzheimer's? Can we identify blood markers? Can we identify um, changes in behavior that we can then turn around and try to target based on what blood chemistry we're collecting and so forth to develop new therapies in Alzheimer's disease. And the woman who twisted my arm to give this talk is shown down here. Um, but if you know of anybody or have an interest in the project, give Roberta a call um, or go to the ABCDS website. You can find it easily if you just Google ABC-DS. So here's an example of genetic Alzheimer's disease, development of these abnormal proteins over time. And then eventually around age 40, you start to see an increase in Alzheimer's disease in these individuals. So what's really neat about current Alzheimer's research is we have new tools to study these proteins. We have PET scans that use different tracers to identify the buildup of beta amyloid in the brain. And what you see here, the more red and orange you see, the more beta amyloid is in that region of the brain. So we now can use this tool to study not just the development or the evolution of clinical dementia, but we can use it 
to actually see if drugs are making a difference. So if we have a treatment, will that treatment reduce amyloid accumulation? We also now have tools to do the same thing with that abnormal protein tau. And again, here is a person who is not demented. And then here's a person with dementia. So you can see the buildup of tau throughout the brain. And note that even though this person is still normal, they have a little bit of tau in their hippocampal region versus here where the temporal lobe and the hippocampus are dramatically affected. But these tools have moved research and clinical trials forward rather dramatically. They've also taught us <clears throat> important information about Alzheimer's disease itself. There are Alzheimer's diseases, if you will, based on how these proteins build up in the brain as people get older. I won't belabor these, uh, but where has the work at Sanders Brown had a major impact? It has had that in these two blue conditions that have been identified only in the last 10 years as Alzheimer mimics, if you will. We have people who develop abnormal tau, but don't show the beta amyloid. And this is known as progressive age-related tauopathy. And this was work originally done by Bill Marksberry uh, in some of, with, some, with the Honolulu uh, Asian American study uh, in Hawaii, and who showed that there were individuals who had lots of tau, but didn't have the amyloid. And then later work with Pete Nelson taking the lead, what is known as limbic predominant Alzheimer's disease, where the tau pathology builds up in the memory structures of the hippocampus and temporal lobe, along with these other Alzheimer type phenomena. And I won't belabor each of these because again, each one would take several hours to work through, but we've identified this mainly through the generosity of the volunteers not just at our Alzheimer's Disease Center, but at the other 30 some odd centers around the country who allow us to follow them on an annual basis, neurologic exams, scans, blood work, and they donate their brain when they die so that we can do the scientific effort to identify those abnormal proteins, the pattern of those abnormal proteins, and identify mechanisms that are driving these abnormal changes in the brain of people with Alzheimer's and related conditions. To keep it simple, here is the new way that we think about Alzheimer's disease. We talk about amyloid, tau, and neurodegeneration. Mm -hmm. And if you remember that graph from before, the, the ramping up of amyloid, the ramping up of tau, and then the structural brain changes. That's what we're looking at here in what is known as the ATN profile. And research has shown that <clears throat> when, we, when we look at these different conditions for these proteins and the brain cell loss, we have different markers that we're using now to try to identify the disease pathway and identify possible treatments. Note, that we have what we now call the Alzheimer's continuum. There's several versions of Alzheimer's disease. You have early stage patho pathologic change, which is all driven by amyloid. And then as you get tau positive, and then as you get neurodegeneration positive. So you have that these three represent those three curves that you saw earlier. The folks at Mayo created this category called SNAP, suspected non-Alzheimer's pathology, where you have amyloid and you have shrinkage of the brain or cell loss, but your brain is not generating the tau protein. That's a unique phenomenon. And then we have other phenomenon where you have no amyloid, no tau, but your brain is shrinking. And then here's part that I mentioned before, where you're tau positive and you have brain shrinkage. And what, what these new tools allow us to do is we can measure amyloid in spinal fluid with those PET scans. And now there's a lot of work on a blood test to look at the 
how much of amyloid gets into the blood, how much amyloid is coming out of the brain into spinal fluid or into plasma. And that's a measure potentially of disease stage, but also how the brain is reacting to that Alzheimer process in those proteins. We can use the tau PET to identify in a living person the tau. In the old days, we used to say you never get a clear diagnosis of Alzheimer's until autopsy. We're getting closer with these tools. We can look at tau in the spinal fluid. So as tau goes up in the spinal fluid, it's more likely you have Alzheimer's. At the same time, a beta goes down in the spinal fluid because it's being deposited in the brain. And we can look in plasma and serum for these different types of tau to help diagnosis. These two combined with the brain shrinkage that you can see in the MRI or using a different PET scan that looks at brain activity, uh, fluorodeoxyglucose PET, or uh, measures of total tau or a new measure called neurofilament light chain, which is a measure of neuronal damage based on the myelin or the sheath that runs along the axon that I showed you in those early pictures. So we're now developing tools to help us classify individuals in these different Alzheimer type conditions. But at the same time, as we study these, we will get at the mechanisms and develop newer therapeutic approaches. So let me drink a little of my tea and let you enjoy this ancient cartoon. Needless to say, I collect lots of cartoons about memory. And I think I, if, I, if I could get that helmet, I guess I could give a talk like that with the, I have the beard already, but the helmet is missing. So let's do a quick review of the brain structures involved in memory. The blue areas that you see in that upper left cartoon of the brain, those areas are involved in short-term memory. And you can see the hippocampus is there as very important. We have mammillary bodies, which often are affected in a different dimension known as Korsakoff's or Wernicke's encephalopathy, uh, often due to uh, misuse of alcohol. Um, we, you sh it shows the amygdala, which is an emotional center very close to the hippocampus and connected to it. Uh, the thalamus, which can lead to memory loss if there uh, is, a, is a stroke affecting the thalamus. And then the frontal lobe, which controls the flow of information. Then the cingulate gyrus, which is in part involved in brain connectivity. And interestingly, some of the imaging studies show that in the posterior sing cingulate, you can get changes early on that, that herald Alzheimer's disease. And here's just a nice picture here of how these, this limbic, these limbic structures are connected to the rest of the brain and how they get input from uh, parietal lobe and association areas. And we know that often the beta amyloid and tau changes will occur around these structures, particularly what's known as the entorhinal cortex. Now, long-term memory, semantic memory, which is your mental library is based primarily, we think, in the temporal lobe. Procedural memory, notice the cerebellum is involved in your sensory motor area. That is overlearned memory. Your ability to walk is a procedural memory. You had to learn to walk. Procedural memory is memory without awareness. So when, when you start playing the piano, you have to learn. Your short-term memory is involved. Then it gets into long-term memory. And eventually, you can knock out tunes if you become adept enough and practice enough. So there's almost procedural memory when you play the piano. And then working memory is here in the prefrontal cortex. Working memory is the brain's ability to take in bits of information, hang on to them, and then decide what to do with it. Am I going to put it in short-term memory, walk down the hall and dial that telephone number, or this is the telephone number of an important person or friend, and I have to move it into long-term memory. 
So the prefrontal cortex with working memory uh, gets involved. So why is this important? About 20 years ago, the concept of preclinical Alzheimer's disease or prodromal Alzheimer's disease came about. Some of the work was done here at UK, some of the work at Mayo Clinic, some at NYU, uh, New York University uh, had an Alzheimer's center, and people got together and defined what eventually became known as mild cognitive impairment. And there's a specific type of mild cognitive impairment that suggests that the person's on their way to developing Alzheimer's, and that's in red. So the patient or the family members say memory is not doing well, uh, it's progressive, um, daily living, activities of daily living are generally normal, but short-term memory is dramatically affected. And that memory impairment stays stable or progresses. There are some people who develop MCI who never become demented and they don't become fully demented because they don't have difficulties in all of their activities of daily living. And note here, we exclude other disorders such as brain tumors, strokes, small vessel disease based on our imaging and our spinal fluid and blood derived markers of those abnormal proteins. So what goes on here when it comes to this notion of complaining memory? I sense that my memory is not what it should be. So the work we've done here at UK early on showed that if you had a complaint, but you didn't test in such a fashion showing a memory deficit, you had the, these types of pathologies in the brain. And these pathologies are based on that ATN network. So basically, a quarter of the people didn't show any Alzheimer's changes. Another third or so showed few changes that looked like Alzheimer's, but it could have been part, could have been another condition. Another third had these intermediate changes in their brain in amyloid and tau. And then two percent, very few already had enough neuropathology to suggest Alzheimer's was already uh, attacking the brain. But if you had the complaint, note person or family, and you showed memory test impairment, look at the difference. 15% more had high neuropathologic findings of Alzheimer's disease, very few showed no Alzheimer changes, and the majority were already showing enough Alzheimer's changes to get qualified or classified neuro neuropathologically as Alzheimer's. So the field has started to pay attention to this notion of a subjective memory complaint, because it may be the canary in the coal mine, so to speak, for dementia in general. And this has generated a lot of interest. There are actual clinical trials targeting uh, some of these memory complaints. Um, the problem is, is we haven't gotten enough brain imaging and enough uh, biologic samples to determine if this pattern holds in the general population. Uh, Dennis Dixon, who's a, a world-class neuropathologist at, at Mayo in Florida, um, has shown us with over a thousand patients that Alzheimer's disease can be seen in 77% of the people who are clinically diagnosed with Alzheimer's. But Alzheimer's comes along with other conditions, as you can see here, and I'll talk about those in greater detail. Um, LBD is Lewy body disease. Uh, you, you may remember uh, Robin Williams passed away from uh, dementia with Lewy bodies. But we also see Alzheimer's changes with these additional protein changes we see with Lewy bodies. We also see Alzheimer's with vascular disease, cerebral amyloid angiopathy. This is a vascular disease due to amyloid in the blood vessels. Alzheimer's disease plus what is known as hippocampal sclerosis of aging and a number of other conditions. The good news is some people get diagnosed with Alzheimer's and don't have it based on their autopsy. Here are the brain comorbidities. Note, 
that pure Alzheimer's disease right here is now less common than Alzheimer's with other brain pathology. And this is becoming a major area of research. So what does the UK have to do with all of this? Well, Peter Nelson and the rest of the team here at the Sanders Brown Center on Aging have been studying the transition that occurs between normal cognition and dementia for many decades. Uh, this is again due to our, our, our fantastic volunteers who uh, actually in 1989, we started uh, the project uh, where people who did not have signs of Alzheimer's would sign up and they would be followed until death and we could obtain an autopsy. And one of the things we find is that age is very important in terms of the presence or absence of these diseases. You note that Alzheimer's disease in the red starts somewhere in the mid 60s and increases well into the hundreds if you get to live that long. And we've seen people as old as 105 years of age in this group. We find that late, which is that hippocampal sclerosis of aging, uh, which is due to a different protein change of a, of a, a tau-derived protein, and I'll talk about it in more detail, the alpha-synuclein, which has evolved in, with Lewy body disease, you can see starts in the 60s, increases, that's the green. We also see cerebrovascular disease starting to increase over time, and arteriolosclerosis, which is changes to the blood vessels. And these seem to be linked together, as you can see in that earlier slide, they can all occur. And this has led to an interest in this new uh, condition called late, as well as part. As you can see, part in the 70s, late tends to hit in the 80s. And clinically, we used to call what I now call late as the slow form of Alzheimer's. We would see memory change, but it progressed slowly because the TDP43 protein changes really focus on the hippocampus and short-term memory. So what's so exciting about this? Well, it, it's exciting because it focuses in on how complicated um, the brain is. And what we used to think is Alzheimer's disease, as you saw, is Alzheimer's disease plus other stuff, other diseases. And there's an old saying in medicine um, called Hickam's dictum that states that patients may have as many diseases as they damn well please. So <laughs> the research I'm showing you is saying that's absolutely correct. What we clinically see as Alzheimer's disease often is Alzheimer's plus something else. Now, what else are we seeing? Well, this is a, a, a manuscript that was published out of our group um, where we took a statistical look. Uh, Dr. Caranth and Dr. Abner, Dr. Nelson, myself, Dr. Crisio, we all get involved. One of the things we saw was that there are many people who have four quadruple misfolded proteins who are demented. So they don't have just the Alzheimer's proteins. They have other proteins driving their dementia. A large portion in the green bar have three distinct abnormal proteins in the brain. Blue is also three distinct proteins. So you can see when you start looking over these cases with dementia, four proteins really drives dementia, whereas mild cognitive impairment, note, you don't see the four misfolded proteins, but you see the tau build up, you see the amyloid, which is kind of that early Alzheimer's process. So the, the field of Alzheimer's research is beginning to recognize that some of the early treatments that we developed when people were saying, well, only half of the people benefited a little bit, there's a reason behind it. They had other diseases with their Alzheimer's. So here we were targeting the memory system 
in Alzheimer's not recognizing the fact that half of the people who were in the studies that led to the approval of these medicines probably had some other disorder or some other combination of disorders. And this has really become a, a hot button area of study. So what do you do? So now we're switching to what the heck can we do to reduce the risk? You obviously can't pick your parents if the presenilin genes are involved. Um, but in terms of sporadic Alzheimer's disease, there was a paper that just came out two years ago in Lancet that said, if you can modify these 12 risk factors, you can pre prevent or delay almost half, 40% of dementias. And you can read these, you can get a sense of how they work. Uh, and what's really interesting is, bless you, they added air pollution. Not only is air pollution important, but newer research is suggesting that where you live and your access to health care is a, an important risk factor for the development of dementia. And how do we know that? We know that from studying groups such as African-Americans who have twice the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. African-Americans in general tend to have less health care access. They have multiple medical comorbidities. Their diet is unique um, in many ways. And because of these health disparities, research in Alzheimer's disease is beginning to focus on different ethnic minorities in the United States to see if we can modify some of those factors and reduce Alzheimer's risk. And one of the fascinating things about this research is that Bill Marksberry and Lon White, who were doing the Honolulu Adult Aging Study years ago, found that Jap these were Japanese Americans who had emigrated to the United States, it's lived in Hawaii, became westernized in terms of diet and habits, and as a result, they showed more Alzheimer's disease than did their counterparts who stayed in Japan. And one of the real issues is diet, uh, diet, exercise, and so forth. So we now know that environmental components are critical. So this is a take home slide for anybody who's worried and wants to prevent or reduce reduce their risk. Interestingly, two years ago at the Alzheimer's Association conference, um, there were new studies suggesting even more potential risk reduction by taking care of your health. If you had been vaccinated for the flu, they found that you were 10 to 20 percent less likely, let's average it at 15 percent, to develop Alzheimer's disease. If you had a pneumonia vaccination, you were 25 to 30% less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. And interestingly, they also showed that if people who have Alzheimer's in the brain get other infections, it accelerates the disease and increases their risk of dying. So we're discovering that taking care of yourself and doing good health prevention, like in the annual wellness visit with your physician, can reduce your risk for Alzheimer's. And this is new information and it's encouraging. And so the research, there's a whole bunch of researchers now who are saying in the old days, we said it's all biological. And I'm not gonna go through all of these, these things because I wanna allow some time for questions in the chat. I see a bunch already. But now we're recognizing environmental contributors. And so we're studying these biologic and environmental conditions and factors to see who does not get Alzheimer's disease. Who gets it is important, but also are there things that in the environment or in the biologic components that we can 
use prevention techniques to reduce Alzheimer's occurrence. And this is a real hot area of, of study right now. And you can see, based on the reference, this just came out last year. And people are talking more and more about this and, and studying these. Note here what I said earlier about minority groups in the United States, that socioeconomic status and to an extent perceived bias in the medical system can be contributors for Alzheimer's disease. And if we improve this, we could potentially help people become more resistant to developing Alzheimer's disease. Real quick, I talked about all these misfolded proteins, but what's hot in the news or has been is the fact that there is a, a, an expensive drug that was approved, uh, aducanumab, or known also as aduhelm. Uh, the FDA approved this drug as an Alzheimer's treatment, not because it showed large clinical benefit, but because using PET scans, it showed that it washed beta amyloid out of the brain for many people. There are a lot of side effects to this drug. Uh, it's, it's expensive to, to use. It's expensive to monitor. But we now have the first approved drug that is not a symptomatic therapy, but actually changes the underlying protein pathology in the brain. And here's a list of just some other drugs that are promising. And you see the red question marks? These are drugs similar to aducanumab that also appear uh, to wash the beta amyloid out of the brain. And so more research into these types of therapies is ongoing and may end up improving um, and reducing Alzheimer's risk if we can stop Alzheimer's in its tracks by affecting these proteins. There are other studies looking at tau and treating tau, um, uh, but now that we have these new tools, our our treatment research is progressing dramatically. And if you're interested in or have a relative who's interested in clinical trials, we have studies for people who have no dementia. We have studies for people who want to prevent dementia if they feel they have a high risk. And we have studies treating dementia. All you need to do is go to the Sanders Brown Center on Aging webpage and you can see what's available locally. And here you see our two directors, Bill Marksberry and Linda Van Eldick, both being scientific and studying how, what is Alzheimer's and how do we present it? So questions, so I will look in the chat. Okay, there are several questions in the chat box. All right, if I don't get to them all, I will try to give a, a uh, compendium so let me get past how to communicate with demented people. I can't, can't keep myself on mute. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm getting past the, uh, um, uh, okay. Ah, Ms. Jones kindly put in the clinical trials link. So what I just said, you can, you can click that link. Does elevated thyroid function have anything to do with or impact Alzheimer's diagnosis? And the answer is yes. Um, we know that hypothyroidism is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Hyperthyroidism can lead to an encephalopathy that looks like a dementia uh, known as Hashimoto's disease. And the good news is they're both treatable. So you can, you can boost thyroid function if you're hypothyroid and you can use steroids to reduce the effects of hyperthyroid function and actually uh, make a difference in that person's life. Uh, there's a question about neurotrauma and neurodegeneration. What is the relationship between chronic traumatic encephalopathy uh, and Alzheimer's? So... Um, the difference is, is that CTE, which is a result of repeated head, head trauma, um, there is tau deposition in the brain, but it is in a different pattern than what you see in Alzheimer's disease. Now, for years, we've known that significant closed head injury 
is a, a risk factor for Alzheimer's. And part of that is due to TBI or traumatic brain injury increasing amyloid production as a repair mechanism. And whenever the brain tries to repair something as the rest of the body, it often makes mistakes. And so beta, the abnormal, as APP increases and is, is cut by enzymes, often the abnormal forms of beta amyloid can accumulate in the brain. And the question goes on to says, is there biomarker research uh, for TBI? The answer is yes. In particular, the neurofilament light chain uh, as a marker of axonal injury um, in the brain is being studied very extensively in uh, head trauma. Um, would you recommend that someone with suspected familial possibility of AD have genetic testing to see if they will be affected or would that cause negative consequences? So um, getting tested for the big risk gene like ApoE4 will cause distress. If you have an ApoE4 allele, even though your risk is elevated, it really isn't going to guarantee that you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. So if you have Alzheimer's in the family, there's a good chance that there's an ApoE4 allele floating around. About 25% of the population has an ApoE4 allele. But what I would do, very simply, is not go through the trauma of the genetic test. And I see people in clinic as young as 30 years of age who come in with their 23andMe and they say, I have an ApoE4 allele. I'm going to get Alzheimer's. What am I going to do? You know, and so they come into the diagnostic clinic and we spend a good two hours talking about Alzheimer's risk. If it's in the family, do the prevention dance, if you will. <laughs> take charge of your health. Take charge of your diet. Exercise. What's good for the heart is good for the head. If in the family, people were getting Alzheimer's at the age of 30, 32, 35, then there's a presenilin mutation. You will know. You don't need the genetic test at this point. In the long run, we will be using more genetic tests as we tailor Alzheimer's treatments. Um, would you want to get tested to get the help of medications to slow down the progression of Alzheimer's? So um, you, you can, the best thing you can do is sign up for a study like the AHEAD study. The AHEAD study looks at people who, may, who have elevated risk and you get a PET scan and blood work that will tell you what your risk is. It'll tell you how much amyloid there is. And at that point, you can actually get some of the amyloid modifying therapies. So, yes, I'd check with uh, Ms. Ms. Jones at our research clinic and look at the options. Okay, excellent. The mind diet. Excellent topic coming up next. And I have one more down at the bottom here. Is there any testing for proteins you previously mentioned? Yes, um, we do, uh, but it's in the research phase. So we have um, a couple of laboratories, including Dr. Wilcox lab here at the Center on Aging, where if you're in one of our studies, um, we analyze your blood sample or your spinal fluid if you, if you uh, donate that for these different Alzheimer's markers. So for instance, the one marker in Down syndrome that is predictive of dementia is what I mentioned before, the A-beta ratio. So there's two components of A-beta that we look at, A-beta 42 versus A-beta 40, and that ratio is predictive of dementia risk. We also can look at tau in the blood, but these are research tests. They're not clinically useful as a diagnostic test just yet. So I've run over by a minute. I appreciate everybody's attention. I will stay on for another couple minutes as we wrap up. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Schmidt. That was a great presentation. Whew, wow, lots of information there.